Um, I'd like to thank you all for uh, having me here to conduct this very important uh, training this evening and, and thanks to all of you for your public service and for taking your time out tonight uh, to learn uh, more about some of the important issues uh, that are related to the roles that you perform. Uh, before we get started, I thought I'd get you, give you a little bit of information about my background. Uh, I didn't just sleep at a uh, Holiday Inn Express last night. I actually have uh, practiced municipal law for uh, 18 years. Uh, and uh, a little over 10 years ago, I uh, founded the Lauber Municipal Law Firm, uh, uh, having only a laptop, a cell phone, and four clients who agreed to come with me when I decided to start my own firm. Uh, today, we have uh, seven full-time attorneys that practice nothing but uh, municipal law from our offices in Lee Summit in Jefferson City. Uh, we serve as the city attorney for 52 Missouri cities, actually 53 as of yesterday. Um, and we serve as the prosecutor for 12 cities uh, and serve as special counsel for several dozen uh, cities covering every facet of, of municipal law, including I've, I've been special counsel uh, for Blue Springs uh, virtually on and off throughout my entire 18-year uh, career. Uh, in 2019, I was honored uh, as an IMLA, the International Municipal Lawyers Association, as a local government fellow. That's an invite only. You have to actually pass an exam and, and uh, uh, be graded by peers across the nation uh, uh, for uh, Municipal Law Works. And I was very uh, honored in, in 2020 when my peers at the Missouri Municipal Attorneys Association recognized me with the Lou Check Award, which is kind of like the Hall of Fame for Missouri Municipal Lawyers. Uh, so been been very fortunate uh, to have a lot of great clients and, and a lot of uh, great opportunity to have experience as a municipal lawyer and very uh, happy that uh, I could be here this evening to kind of uh, help out with uh, some additional information about, again, those roles that you uh, undertake. So really, actually beginning last fall, I began working with the city's administrative and, and legal staff uh, as we designed a training program specifically for the city of Blue Springs to address some of the issues important to the city's operation. I'll be presenting this information actually in a two-part program. The biggest part, uh, the more general part, is this evening to this, uh, this group. And then in a few more weeks, I'll be actually conducting a second training that will be specific to city council, to the planning commission, to the uh, board of zoning adjustment uh, that have kind of more uh, roles that are kind of more specialized that we'll, we'll be uh, dealing with uh, that evening. So I have a lot of material to cover for you tonight. And quite honestly, we, probably, we may not even be able to get to quite all of it. I'm going to do my best to do that, but also still you know, be uh, uh, respectful of your time and, and being able to get you out of here. One of the things we did talk about is we're going to set it up so that I, I'm going to go through each of the, the three different kind of presentations or segments that we're going to cover this evening. And then at the end of each segment, we're going to do a question and answer at that point. That way we can kind of make sure we can get through as much of the material as possible. And sometimes, you know, the, the, the question that you may have is actually answered, you know, on the, on the next slide or the slide after that. So um, uh, we're, we're going to uh, address the topics this evening of First Amendment and social media. We're going to talk about the Missouri Sunshine Law in our second segment. And we're also going to talk in our third sec section this evening about uh, ethics and conflict of interest rules. So uh, again, so we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, on the, uh, the issues of uh, First Amendment and uh, social media. So the use of social media, email, uh, electronic communications, texting by city uh, officials and city employees is transforming government, has been transforming government really, you know, for the last, you know, 15, 20 years uh, at this point. Uh, things have been, you know, changing fairly quickly. Uh, social media is, you know, evolving from being strictly a tool to disseminate uh, public information to an intended and an unintended uh, public engagement platform. So a lot of times, uh, at the you know the outset of electronic information, you know, it's kind of like one-way communications were going out. But as we've you know developed more of these social media type platforms, Facebook, Twitter, those types of things, where people are you know, instantly able to uh, read a, a response and then make comments and then comment on each other's responses. Uh, you can see how quickly things uh, began to, uh, begin to uh, evolve and, and, and change and, and create a tremendous amount of information out there. So when you look at these issues and, and the, 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 how quickly information disseminates, there's always going to be a challenge for courts in particular to, uh, to figure out how to apply 
established and familiar law with respect to First Amendment to this electronic media. And that's where, you know, you know, in the, in the end of things, you know, how much the, the, the city government can, can and does regulate speech, what they can and can't do, is going to be an issue of liability. And again, we're here, you know, kind of this evening to talk about public officials' liability and how that intersects with, with your roles as, as public officials when you're out there also, you know, living your personal lives. So, Important is the fact that, you know, and, and we kind of always have to look back to kind of like the basis because, you know, every, every time we, we look at what, you know, rights are out there, we always kind of look to what has the United States Supreme Court said about that? Have they been in a position where they have, you know, identified, you know, a right, you know, because it certainly does not say in the, in the United States Constitution, thou shalt have a right to post on Facebook, okay? It definitely doesn't say that. So the question then becomes is where does that, uh, where does that fall then in the realm of, of free speech? And that's going to be a, you know, the, really the theme of this piece of the, the conversation uh, this evening. So what I can tell you is, uh, uh, whoops, I've actually changed the slide. Sorry about that. Uh, what I can tell you is that in Packingham versus North Carolina, the United States Supreme Court uh, has recognized uh, the, the internet and, uh, and uh, social media in particular as a very, uh, open uh, forum for uh, public speech, for free speech. Uh, and so, you know, what we know about those open forums is the fact that, that the, your speech in those areas is actually going to be protected. You're going to be able to say more than in areas where maybe uh, government can regulate and, and you have the ability to kind of uh, restrict down. So, so we will uh, delve into kind of what that means then in the, in the next little bit of this, uh, this presentation. So before we, I'm going to give you examples of a couple cases that are out there that kind of help. Sometimes when you hear the story, it might stick a little bit better when you're trying to think through, you know, something that you're doing. You know, are you, you know, maybe acting as the government when you are, you know, putting something out there at this point? Because you each, you know, you're here tonight because you have government roles. So you have to think about the fact, am I the government when I'm doing that? And is, you know, the action that I'm taking in any way restricting someone else's speech? And, uh, and, but also to talk about like how your speech, you know, you don't check your rights at the door when you either are appointed or elected to a position, you still maintain free speech rights. So there's, there's always this balance that we have to look at with respect to these issues when we're talking about city uh, officials. So in talking about that, one of the things we got to get to is kind of the basis of what we call forum analysis. Uh, so there are many, you know, there are a couple different kinds of fora uh, out there and, and the type of, of like where you are speaking from, if you will, and sometimes that you have to think outside the box about it. It's not necessarily just a place, you know, maybe that you can touch or feel like this podium, but it might be, you know, something that's a little bit more uh, abstract like, you know, the internet, you know, the, the ether, if you will. Um, so. Uh, one of the things you have to talk about is what type of forum are you dealing with when you talk about whether, how much, and whether you can be restricted uh, or you can restrict someone else's speech. We're going to always be talking really about both sides of, of, of that equation. So uh, looking at uh, um, forum analysis, we will, we will look at whether you have a traditional limita limited, designated, or non-public forum and then you'll have to apply the, the legal standards that, that work for each of those type of fora. So uh, in, in talking uh, about those protected speech, uh, courts will typically per apply a strict or an intermediate scrutiny, which are kind of higher level tests to pass. Like this, the, this, the state will have a difficult time, the government will have a difficult time restricting someone's speech if it is protected speech versus non-protected speech. Uh, what are examples of non-protected speech? They would be things like obscenity, defamation, fraud, incitement, fighting words, uh, true threats, uh, speech that involves a criminal intent. All of those things are, are non-protected speech. So when we, we cross that line from protected into non-protected speech, our ability to both you know, restrict someone's speech or to have your own speech restricted uh, it, the ability you know, for that to, restriction to apply is greater on those things that are non-protected. 
So with traditional public forum, what we're talking about are the areas where people have traditionally been able to express their ideas. So, you know, if you can think of the physical places, when we talk about traditional public fora, uh, what we're talking about is, you know, maybe that you can imagine that 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 uh, grandstand at the park or that public sidewalk in front of a, a public building, uh, you know, the steps of the courthouse, the step, you know, uh, you think about, you know, the many places that you've seen, you know, kind of more robust speech to occur. Those are those tend to be traditional uh, public forum. Um, then you can have limited or designated public forum, okay? And, and so as I mentioned in the slide before is if you've got traditional public forum, then your, your speech is gonna be more protected where you're allowed to speak more openly, okay? And then each time you funnel that down, there's a greater ability to A, restrict, restrict someone's speech or B, that your speech you know, in those areas will be restricted. So when you move from traditional public forum what I like to kind of point out is like a limited or a designated public forum. You might have the ability to come into uh, the lobby of a library, uh, but you know you might not be able to shout at the top of your lungs. So there's you know there's the, the how disruptive your speech is, but then you know inside the library versus outside on the steps, we're going are going to be treated differently, and your speech is going to be more limited when you come in. One of the places that we always kind of talk about is your ability to maybe to come into City Hall and speak with somebody. Uh, you know, in the lobby versus, uh, or, you know, whether you can even get past, you know, the lobby and go back to the back offices. And uh, so really that points up a great distinction between like maybe the difference between a limited or a designated public forum where, you know, maybe you as a citizen uh, can come in and speak at a planning and zoning commission meeting in a hearing or a board of zoning adjustment hearing, uh, or something like that. You know, you have the ability as the as a citizen to come in, or you have the ability as a government to say these citizens will come in. But we're going to control the speech somewhat more than we would if, if they wanted to pick it outside with signs. So, um, so maybe walking it all the way through each of those types of fora as as we discuss it, outside on on the sidewalk, you could protest whatever business is being taken on inside. And, you know, be shouting and loud signs and so forth. When you walk inside City Hall, uh, your, your ability to do that is going to be lessened so that you're not creating disruption. Uh, but, and you might be limited as someone who wants to speak is, you know, the governing body will set up or, or the, the body that is meeting will set up an agenda and they will say public comments will be, you know, at item five and it will be three minutes apiece. You know, and that is a great example of a limited public forum. You may speak but only at item five and only for three minutes per topic. And that is, that is free speech that is in a limited public forum. And then that non-public non forum would be, you know, the example would be is while that's all going on, you can't just walk in to the city administrator's office, put your feet up on the desk and decide to, you know, uh, uh, pontificate about, you know, how you feel about the world, you know, in that standpoint, because that, that is going to be a, a non-public forum and your speech in that, in that range uh, will be uh, much more highly restricted. Okay, so when uh, the government is actually looking to uh, restrict speech, or if, if you're uh, if you're if you're considering whether your speech your speech has been overly restricted uh, by a, a, a state actor, you have to look at whether the restrictions that are being placed on it are content neutral or content based, and for those of you maybe on the Planning and Zoning Commission or the City Council, if you've had to deal with uh, the city's sign ordinances, this has really become a hot topic since about 2015 due to the uh, Reed case uh, uh, that was decided by the, uh, Missouri, uh, by the uh, United States Supreme Court. And so when you make a regulation, so and, and so this will come into play when you as a planning commissioners, for example, might be considering sign codes or as a city council, if you're looking to approve ordinances related to your sign codes, if you apply a sign code that is content based, uh, then you will have, uh, you, you must, uh, you will be subject to what's called strict scrutiny, okay? Strict scrutiny is what we call fatal from a, from a legal analysis. So, you know, what we have to do, you know, with respect to that, and here, here's a great example, especially when the Reed case applied this content, te content test to our sign codes, is before you could have, you know, particular uh, uh, code that would say, you know, for rent signs would say, you know, 
uh, would, you know, would be allowed you know, during a certain time, or political signs, most importantly, would be allowed you know, for a period of time before the election, and so forth. And what the Reed case ultimately said is that if you have to read the sign itself to understand which, you know, whether, which, uh, which regulation to apply, then it's probably going to be content-based. So if you have a, a sign code that says political signs are only allowed during a certain time of the year, I have to read that sign to know whether it is, you know, vote for Smith or whether it is, you know, um, something else, you know, eat, eat tacos tonight or something, you know. Um, so, and then, so now what, what, like, lawyers like myself are charged with doing when it comes to that is we have to change the, the regulations in such a way to make them so that they are not content-based. So instead of saying political signs are only allowed, you know, for 30 days or 60 days prior to the election date and have to be down a week later, what we would have to change it to to say is there is a sign season in our city and sign season lasts 60 days before, you know, the, the, the first Tuesday following the first Monday in April. Uh, which we know is you know the the election date, and they have to be down you know a week after that, and then you're you're only allowed to have a sign of a certain size, but we don't say what that sign says. So you might have a sign that says "Vote for Smith," but at the same time, honestly, we can't regulate any further that you know someone could say you know you know I hate jaguars or something like that you know because they might live on the, the north side of town. So uh, so. That is uh, kind of the difference between content-based and content-neutral. So if you can stay content-neutral, your regulations that you put into place are going to be, uh, they're going to have a much higher likelihood of passing. If you're, if you're, if you're content-based, it's probably going to fail. If, if, in, in, I mean, most likely going to fail. That's usually fatal. So strict scrutiny, least restrictive means, a compelling government interest, presumptively valid. If you switch over to content-neutral, all you need to worry about is being reasonable in your, in your time, place, and manner. You have to be narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest and leave open alternative uh, channels, ample alternative channels. So that's a little discussion on uh, the, the, the uh, content-based or content-neutral uh, uh, tests. So when you're talking about reasonable and, and viewpoint neutral, some of the things to keep in mind, so again, we're, you know, we're talking here about the uh, the, uh, con uh, the uh, content neutral type uh, 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 regulations. You can have a Facebook page, for example, as the city providing information with no option for public discussion or comments, okay? And I prefer these as a lawyer. I like to say, if you're gonna have a city Facebook page, you really should be a one-way communicator. You're pushing information out to the public. It's a place to get it out there. But if you allow comments, then, and you've opened that interaction, you know, that, that area where speech can occur, uh, you've opened your forum, and then you're going to have a difficult time, you know, uh, in a situation where you want to restrict, like, you, you know, someone might say, you know, we're doing a free dog wash today or something like that, and then people come out and say, I love cats, I hate dogs, you guys are terrible because you did a free dog wash today or something like that, you know, you're not going to be able to, 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 you know, delete those comments, if that makes sense. It doesn't make sense, but it, I mean, it's the law, so. Um, Let's see here. So I'm going to move into a couple cases uh, that we can kind of talk about. And, and some of these you may have read about in the paper or seen on the news uh, that deal with uh, public officials who have utilized social media uh, and then have felt reper repercussions for, uh, uh, for free speech uh, uh, issues. And so the first case that, you know, is kind of maybe pretty infamous, if you will, is uh, Knight versus Trump. It's a Second Circuit case, so it's a federal court of appeals case. Um, and so, uh, you know, not getting into all the details here on the slides, essentially what we had is uh, uh, President Trump, former President Trump, had a, uh, had a uh, Twitter feed, and it was a Twitter feed that he actually had personally before he decided to run for office and uh, he just continued that, that Twitter feed over once he got into office. And, you know, I'm, a lot of people heard about all this. And, then, of course, there's the big uproar now about the fact that he's banned from Twitter and so forth. But um, what happened was uh, the president, you know, if people were being critical at, at that time. He actually started blocking tweets. And in, a, and in a nutshell, what the Second Circuit found is because the president was using his Twitter feed in a way to put out 
to, to disseminate governmental information. He basically was acting as a public actor. So he was acting as the state, as the government. And then, you know, to, in order to come back and, and then delete certain comments that were coming out, he was then restricting speech because, you know, he was using it in a, as the government and it was no longer his private page, even though it had been before. And then deleting comments that he disagreed with actually was restricting those folks' speech. And so you have to be careful when you are a public actor, if you're out there and you are using your Facebook, your social media feeds, for example, to put information out. Like say you're the, the chairperson of the, of the Planning and Zoning Commission and you want to put out information about what P&Z is up to, and then you know somebody disagrees with maybe either you know an item you have coming up. I had a, a client recently that they had uh, they had a slaughterhouse application come through for their planning and zoning commission. Woo! That was, that caused uh, a lot of people to be in uproar, and there was a lot of and there was feedback you know on Facebook for that one. You know people that you know felt you know were kind of like pro business and they wanted to see this this slaughterhouse coming in, there were a lot of people who didn't like it, didn't like, you know, the potential for the smell and the, you know, everything else that was going on, you know, to, to slaughter these cattle. And there was a whole, you know, blow up on there. And so, um, you know, you just have to be careful if you're utilizing your page and maybe it is your personal page, but you're treating it as though you're putting out information about a board or a commission that you are serving on, uh, you might turn that into a government uh, run site, and then you're going to limit your own ability to restrict people from speaking on it. So again, that's why I keep kind of talking about, you know, you know, you might want to comment on this yourself, but you know, and then, but also be thinking about when you're putting stuff out there, are you creating, you know, a government uh, uh, speech situation? So anyway, long story short, on uh, Knight versus Trump. Uh, former President Trump's uh, site was determined to be a government site, and it, he essentially uh, had violated uh, free speech rules when he was uh, blocking folks on Twitter and, and deleting any sort of comments. Another case that we can uh, we'll talk about just briefly is Davidson versus Randall. It's a Fourth Circuit case, uh, so out of the uh, state of Virginia. Uh, is, is covered by the, the Fourth Circuit. And here we actually had a chairwoman of the County Board of Supervisors, which, you know, if that was translated to Jackson County, that would be our county legislature. If you're familiar with other counties, they would have like county commissions. So that, it's their, their county governing body in this circumstance. She, she ran a Facebook page called Chair Phyllis Rand. So, uh, um, and then it was actually designated. Sometimes you can look on Facebook, it'll ask what type of page is this? Is it a commerce page? Is it a personal page? Hers was designated a government official page. And she was using it to do all those things for the county. She was putting out information about meetings and, and you know, what was going on at the county and things like that. So she was clearly uh, using that uh, there. And uh, uh, Mr. Davidson, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the plaintiff in this case, uh, was a regular commenter. We'll call it that. Sometimes people call that trolls, but um, but you know, it was somebody who was who was constantly kind of sniping at Chairman uh, uh, Phillips. And apparently, late one night, she got mad about something that he put out there. Basically, he had said something to the effect of "they're all on the take" or something like that. She got mad about it. She deleted the post that she had put out there and banned Mr. Davidson from her page. She was sick of it. Well, she got up early the next morning, you know, kind of had an epiphany overnight, thought, oh, I shouldn't have done that. So she went back and she unbanned Mr. Davidson. Too late. The fact that she had done it, the fact that she had actually deleted uh, his, uh, the entire quotes because she didn't like, or the comments that were lining up on the string, and the fact that she had banned him was enough that she had actually violated his free speech because of all of those things that she had done, create, making that page a government page that made it so that she could not uh, actually delete those comments and could not uh, 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 ban uh, Mr. Davidson in that way. So uh, maybe surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, there's a case in Missouri that, you know, based on the other cases that we had seen uh, that had kind of gone the way of finding a government page, we have a case out of the Eighth Circuit. It happens to be a Missouri case. The Eighth Circuit covers uh, Missouri. And we have uh, Sherry Tolson Reich, who's the uh, representative from uh, the 40, for the 44th district, which is uh, Randolph County, uh, Boone County. It's kind of uh, just north and east of, of Columbia. Uh, 
Ms. Reich, was, uh, she was elected in, in 2016, but in 2018 she was running for election again, and she quoted, she, she made a tweet out there with respect to uh, her opponent, uh, made some comment about her, uh, whether she was being uh, patriotic or not do, during the, the Pledge of Allegiance, and somebody jumped on that, kind of, you know, uh, said, you know, it, you know, basically criticized her tweet about this, this patriotism, and uh, she uh, ultimately, uh, blocked uh, that person and dozens of other people who are kind of commenting on that. Uh, in this circumstance, the, uh, the district court, uh, the Eastern, uh, Eastern Missouri District Court actually did find that she was operating a government page and had said that she had um, acted under color of state law and that's what we kind of say, like you're acting like the government so you're gonna, you know, you're gonna be more you know, restricted in your ability to restrict someone you know, uh, from that standpoint. And so they, the district court uh, found in favor of the plaintiff. When it went to the Eighth Circuit, the Eighth Circuit looked at this and said, well, this is really more of a, a, a political page. It's her I'm running for office kind of page. And they actually overturned it, which was a little bit surprised to, to most of the lawyers that are following this stuff because you know, it seemed to us that it kind of followed along with you know, some of the things that we had said. But in Missouri, in the Eighth Circuit at this point, uh, because you know, uh, uh, Representative Reich was was using a personal page, was doing it more you know in tune with only her her actual race for uh, for the election, and uh, and not you know about actual official representative business. That in that circumstance, the Eighth Circuit found that um, that she had not uh, violated the, the free speech rights of of Ms. of uh, of uh, Mr. Kim. Okay. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about employees and social media. Uh, as I said earlier, public employees, public appointees, do not surrender all of their First Amendment rights by reason of their appointment or their employment uh, with the city. Uh, the government entities have a, a broader dis discretion to restrict speech in when it acts as an employer, uh, but the restrictions it imposes must be directed at speech that has uh, the potential to affect the, uh, the entity's operations, okay? And so um, what, you know, the takeaway from this is what the First Amendment protects when you are, as an elected official, when you are working as an employee and you are trying to comment on social media is you have a First Amendment right to speak as a citizen addressing matters of public concern, okay? When you start to step away from matters of public concern uh, into uh, more, you know, things that deal, you know, like maybe with just with the, the back, uh, the, the, the operations of the city, you know, more to do with uh, um, uh, respect in the workplace and, and things like that, then you, uh, um, that's probably not a great way to say that. So like, you know, supervisory kind of uh, chain of command and those types of things, you're, you know, in disruption of the workplace, uh, then, then that's when uh, you're gonna get away from a matter of public concern and into an area that the, that, the, that the city, the government, does have some more ability to uh, restrict your rights. So um, the, uh, Pickering test is, is the, the test from 1983 that, that actually talks about whether an employee speaks on, uh, a, as a citizen on a matter of public concern or whether that is, is more uh, speaking uh, to uh, you know, more the, the entity's operations. Um, let's see, so again, not, so what, what can employers discipline for and what can they not discipline for? What can government employers do? So uh, the types of, of, of restrictions and the type of regulations that government can impose upon employees you know, would do with more like things like excessive use of social media. You know, so if you're being paid to be the billing clerk um, and you're sitting there and you're spending you know, you know, five of your eight hours a day uh, posting on social media, while you might be exercising your free speech, you're, you're definitely not doing the, uh, the citizens that, that are paying your salary any favors. So, that, you know, the, so the time spent on social media is definitely something that, that the, uh, the, the government entity can regulate. Um, if the government entity has a social media policy and it sets the rules ahead of time, as long as that is not overly restrictive from, from a free speech standpoint, then a city can uh, 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 enforce its uh, uh, social media policy. 
So what are the things that government uh, cannot discipline employees for? If there are protected activities, you know, that, that discussion uh, you know, of matters on a, on a public concern, or if you're actually speaking you know, specifically to you know, some of the, the, you know, the highly protected uh, uh, First Amendment rights, um, political or other protected speech, you know, those are all reasons you know, that the city, you know, so you know, you know, truthfully what happens is you know, if, you know, what, I mean, if you have uh, an employee that, that disagrees with you know, a candidate for mayor or council or, or you know, any you know, sort of election, you know, even a, you know, an item that's up there, you know, there is, that person does not lose their ability to, to speak on that uh, in, in, you know, then now they would not be able to do that in their official capacity. So let's say, um, let's say you have uh, your personal page versus, you know, like a, a page where you're the chairman, you know, there would be more regulation allowed if, if you were, you were speaking only as the chairman or chairperson of a particular ent uh, body, like a, a commission or something like that, as opposed to if you were just speaking on your, you know, uh, Jill Smith, you know, my personal Facebook page. Okay, so uh, if you, so if you kind of understand, you know, the difference here is, you know, it keeps always turning on whether you're 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 speaking as yourself as a citizen versus whether you you have put yourself in a position where you are speaking as an appointed or an elected official. Okay, so those are are, are very important uh, issues there. So let's talk a moment about social media policies. Um, in this day and age, it is important for cities to have social media policies. I'm not sure, uh, I think I, I talked with Jackie earlier, I think that's something that, that we don't have right now in, in Blue Springs. It's something that, that is highly recommended, so it would be something you know, for the, the city council to maybe uh, make, a, make a, a, a point to kind of uh, 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 begin to work on and, and get something passed. But, um, what you want to do with your social media policy is to set the ground rules for public input and public comments. Um, you want to have a purpose statement. You know what is the purpose of, of laying out a social media policy. Uh, you would want someone who is the administrator of that policy, and you would want to put down a comment policy. You know I mentioned earlier is if you're going to have a Facebook page, is it going to be a page that you're going to allow comments on at all, or are you going to utilize it as you know a, a way of projecting information out? as a kind of a one-way, easy way to uh, disseminate public information, but we're not necessarily looking for feedback on that. Maybe we provide other channels for feedback uh, from that standpoint. Um, you do, uh, in addition to addressing the uh, employees' social media uh, activities, you should also address uh, elected officials' social media activities. So you have some ground rules that you work from, and, you know, I'm constantly brought into cities where, you know, I may be brought in as the independent third party that will investigate, you know, here are, you know, a group of activities that, you know, you know maybe, you know, this board or this commission or, or these elected officials are, are undertaking and they will bring me in, you know, kind of as a guy that's not connected, you know, in any way to the city to say, hey, take a look at what's going on here. Is there, you know, any means in this circumstance to discipline somebody for the type of speech that they are doing? But, you know, and the first thing I'm going to ask them for is their social media policy. Because if you don't have a policy, you know, you might have the Wild West uh, uh, from that standpoint. So, uh, so definitely uh, some good points uh, about uh, uh, the uh, social media policies. Um, I do, uh, I would like to point out too, I think that note's there at the bottom, that content posted on a government website is going to be subject to the Missouri Sunshine Law and record retention law. So you do have to keep that in mind. Uh, social media uh, usage policy. Uh, you need to, uh, to, to make a determination whether social media in the workplace is prohibited, monitored, or allowed within reasonable time limits. And what I'm you know, kind of talking about here is can someone sit there at their desk and you know, be tweeting something out, or or pay, posting something on Facebook, or is that something that's prohibited, uh, where you know that phone needs to be put away during work hours, you know, other than you know maybe just emergencies. But that's where you set those rules is in a policy like that. Um, people need to understand that there are no expectations of privacy while using the internet on employer equipment. Okay, if you are working from a city issued cell phone, a city owned and paid for cell phone. That is uh, public domain, and the stuff that you put on there is subject to 
search uh, much more easily than if you're using your own. I, I get this question kind of regularly from clients in that, uh, like I have some cities that provide a cell phone and I have other cities that provide a stipend. And we're gonna get into the, the details of that with respect to the Sunshine Law uh, when I cover that material here in just a little bit. But it makes a difference whether it's your personal phone and it's, it's simply being paid for or you're using a city phone you know, as to how uh, open or closed you know, the records might be with respect to that or at least reachable uh, by the Sunshine Law. And of course your social media and your electronic uh, uh, communications policy should uh, address that. Um, you want to be careful to enforce your social media policy consistently and if you develop your policy that should be part of your hiring packet uh, and, and that should be in you know all the documents that an employee signs when they come in and you have them read and acknowledge the fact that they've got that. So um, I think with that I'm going to wrap up my uh, discussion on the uh, electronic, uh, the social media and the First Amendment uh, and as promised before if you have questions, I think what they're going to have you do is come up to this microphone so that everybody can hear you. This is also being recorded for later use, and that way that information is, uh, is captured. But we're going to take about five or ten minutes, I think, Jackie, is that right, for some questions. If you, if you're not, if you don't have that many, you know, obviously we can get started. We'll just sit here and look at each other. But, uh, so uh, uh, happy to field any questions that you have. You have one. You uh, I guess come on up. And it's like the price is right. You get to come down and. <laughs> I guess. I guess where I'm confused a bit is we are volunteers. Yes. And you keep saying employees. And you keep saying kind of referring to as if we are employed by the city. Right. Yeah, so I have to kind of cover all of the aspects because we're going to have, so I guess, so let me know a little bit, like, so what is your volunteer role so I can understand that better, maybe I can better answer your question, so. Park Commission. Park Commission, okay, but you are serving on a commission, you were probably appointed by the mayor, and it was, it was subject to approval by the city council, okay. So, in addition to be a volunteer, thank you, is you are also an appointed commissioner, okay. So now you are an appointed official of the city, so you are a city official probably didn't get a badge or you know any special sticker for your car or anything like that but that does draw you now into you know so you're uh, we'll cover it in a little bit as a parks commissioner you now form a piece of a public governmental body if so many of you are together you've formed a quorum and only a quorum can do business things like that so you as an as an appointee and anybody else in the same position that, that she is in you are subject to that appointee piece so you are you know you are a piece of the government so if you are, you know, you've got your, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but uh, so if you're, if you have Molly's personal Facebook page and you're just talking about your dog or your cat and your kids or, you know, whatever, and, and you don't mix your city business in there, that's fine. Or, or if you, uh, but if you, you know, you start mixing a whole lot of your city business in there, you could create a situation like we were just talking about where you could switch your personal page over to a public page. So you have to be careful about that. And that's why a lot of people, they will have a personal page, and then if they do want to post on social media about the role that they perform, then they will actually make a special page just for that. But different rules will apply when you treat your social media uh, like a, you know, as a government page or where you're putting information out about Parks Commission in that circumstance. You might want to say, hey, T-ball signups are, you know, next month, and you're, you're talking about that. Or maybe you have a situation, you know, maybe you've dealt with this where you've got, you know, problem, like people have a problem with one of your umpires or, you know, something like that. And, you know, they're saying some not so nice stuff and you want to defend your umpires, you know, you have to start to be careful when you get into that interchange uh, on, that, on that information, okay? Okay. Come on, don't be shy. I answered it all, didn't I? This is the most confusing stuff that's out there. This is confusing for me. This law changes so fast. Uh, and I will tell you that, you know, the law itself doesn't keep up with the technology. So it does make it very difficult. You know, as soon as we think we've got something figured out, then the next new thing comes out, changes everything. So, uh, you know, try to deal with records retention in Snapchat, for example. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, shy, aren't you? 
Uh, Jackie, did you want to take a break between sessions then for just a little bit or we'll keep cruising? Okay, we'll do that. All right, you guys asked for it. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so our next segment that we're going to talk about, as promised, is the Missouri Sunshine Law. Woo! So I saw, it was very cool uh, that they have distributed to you the uh, Attorney General's uh, Sunshine Law book uh, on, on your tables. I will tell you that every time I go to a meeting for any of my clients, I take a binder that deals with you know whichever type of city that I'm going to that has their stuff in it, and tucked in that binder is that exact book. I use the heck out of that book. It is a great book. So um, it answers a lot of great questions. It's really organized well, it gives great examples. So definitely, uh, if you have interest in Sunshine Law, follow that book for sure. And uh, that is an older version of it because it doesn't have Eric Schmidt's picture on it, uh, but uh, that is exactly what is uh, the picture in, in that page. So what is Missouri Sunshine Law? Uh, so if you all have uh, horrific insomnia and are super bored, I would say go crack open uh, Missouri Revised Statutes chapter 610 and just take a read through or actually if you if you want the cliff notes that's what you have in front of you right there so uh, it was originally enacted in 1973 what was going on in the United States in the, in the early to mid 1970s anybody remember I hope, I hope there's old enough people in here Watergate yes thank you so uh, we had uh, some serious issues yeah, very nice very nice yes Jeez, thank you for taking a bow uh, so we had Watergate going on uh, huge questions about uh, the ability to uh, to uh, uh, distribute or to request documents that are public and whether or not you can keep them uh, 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 closed or, or not. And so, uh, you know, after Watergate, all over the country, states were passing, you know, open records and open meetings laws uh, to ensure that that you know there was there was transparency in in government uh, actions and so forth. So, so uh, so these are uh, as I said intended to open governmental meetings, records, and votes uh, to to a certain extent. So, who is subject to the Sunshine Law? Okay, uh, and this will kind of get a little bit back to Molly's question a little bit ago. So, public governmental bodies are subject to the Sunshine Law, and the easiest example of a public governmental body have, would be like Blue Springs City Council. Okay. That's your legislative body, the body that's charged with uh, making the laws. But what I will tell you is it doesn't stop with the city council. Okay? It goes to committees, boards, commissions, uh, advisory committees, even, you know, you know, you want to talk about volunteers who in that circumstance are just brought together maybe one time to, you know, talk about what we should do about, you know, uh, vicious dog laws or something like that, and they want public input on something like that, and it may be a one-time deal, but if you've been assembled by that public governmental body, then that's going to put sunshine law requirements on you as well. And uh, quasi-public uh, governmental bodies, um, which are, you know, uh, probably kind of similar, but, you know, they're not fully, you know, like set up, you know, maybe by statute or by ordinance, but they're, they're put together to perform uh, some, some sort of a semblance of a, a governmental role. So it's pretty widespread. So what is subject to the Sunshine Law? Well, you can see there, public meetings are subject to the Sunshine Law, public business that is being conducted, public records, and public votes. So what I will say, and, and the way the Sunshine Law reads, and it might even be in the language that you have in the book in front of you, is the Missouri Sunshine Law is to be liberally construed. So if there's a rule out there and there's a question uh, about that, that law, then you know if it's like, well, is it open or is it not? The answer by the Sunshine Law itself says, then the answer is it should be open, okay? And then what, you will, what we're gonna talk about in a few minutes is there are exceptions to the Sunshine Law. So there are certain meetings that can be closed, certain records that can be closed, and the Sunshine Law on the subject of records says the exact opposite. It says all exceptions to the Sunshine Law should be strictly construed. So if there's a question as to whether you can close an, a meeting or, uh, or a record at any point, the answer really is no, if, if there's even a question about it. So, and that's where, you know, kind of we come in, you know, Jackie, for, for you guys, will, you know, help to provide answers on guidance as to, you know, either maybe what courts have said or what the law says on that. But to be on the safe side, you should assume everything is subject to the Sunshine Law and is open unless it has been otherwise closed. And in fact, the law says just that. 
All meetings, all records are to be open unless closed. And we'll talk about you know, how that can be done kind of on a more broad-based uh, uh, measure in a minute. So we talked you know, about social media and we talked about First Amendment in the first segment, but let's, you know, let's talk about that you know, electronic technology again as, as, as we're dealing with the, with the sunshine. So as we all know, technology is rapidly changing and evolving, uh, but what I will tell you is that 1973 sunshine law, while it has had amendments, those amendments come slowly, okay? And, and they do not keep up with uh, the status of our uh, of our technology uh, very well at all. Um, so uh, when the Sunshine Law was originally drafted in 1973, you know, think back if, if you were around in 73, I mean, we were still using the ching, ching, ching typewriters, you know, ting, you know, like that. And, you know, there, you know, everything was on paper. It was a very physical document, you know, we, and it was, you know, being produced much more slowly than, than it is today. You know, we're here, you know, we could be ripping out, you know, 25 tweets, you know, in, in five minutes, uh, you know, as you go. And, and uh, we'll talk about it in a minute. You know, you could literally have three meetings going on at once right in front of your eyes because, you know, people might be texting and, and you know, messaging in other ways instead of just actually speaking face to face. So there's a lot of uh, concerns that, that come in. Um, one of the, uh, the concerns that we have seen more recently in Missouri was kind of a big deal, it was a big deal, um, was uh, M Missouri Attorney General uh, Hawley had to conduct an investigation to Governor Greitens and his staff's use of the, of the app Confide. And what was happening with Confide, you know, I made my comment, off, offhanded comment about Snapchat a little bit ago, but Confide would allow individuals to send encrypted, self-destructing, screenshot-proof text messages. <laughs> you know, there's definitely nothing in the Sunshine Law that deals with that. We also, you know, in addition to the Sunshine Law, we have Missouri Secretary of State records retention laws that have to be followed. Um, and so there were huge issues uh, with respect to Governor Greitens, uh, former Governor Greitens' use of of that app and the fact that it was creating public records that were then, you know, you couldn't screenshot them, you couldn't save them, and they were self-destructing uh, and they were encrypted. So sounds pretty close to me, not very transparent uh, from, from that standpoint. Um, so, uh, so something to, to be aware of, you know, as you look at that. So let's talk a little bit about cell phones in particular, and this is something I mentioned a little bit before, is Cell phones and other methods of, of electronic communication create real challenges for the Sunshine Law in its, in its uh, current uh, setup. Whether voicemails, texts, and emails are stored on a cell phone or a similar equipment, uh, uh, wh whether that's going to be open or not, really depends on who owns the phone and who owns the server that the information is either stored on or passes through. So that's a piece that a lot of people don't think about. Um, so as you know, I mentioned before, if your phone is owned by the public entity or the information that passes through it or, or that, that is disseminated actually is stored on a publicly owned server, so the city server, even though, you know, you know, so you might have a city email that runs through a city server that you're, you've you know, connected to your Outlook on your own private you know, iPhone or Samsung or you know, whatever, if you're running your information through the city server, that information that you're putting out there is going to be a public record, even if it's on your own phone, okay? Does that, everybody get that? Okay. So if it's a public record, unless it is closable, you know, ex you know, there's an exception for it for some reason, that is going to be an open record, you know, subject to Sunshine Law Review. However, if your phone is privately owned, and if the information passed through it uh, or, is, or is stored only on private servers, so, you know, like maybe, you know, if your cell phone provider is, is T-Mobile and you, so you have a T-Mobile phone, it passes only through T-Mobile servers, you don't use any city server in any certain way on that, then your information that you're putting on your phone is going to be private and what, you know, we have, you know, we'll say as lawyers is, you know, in order for us to be able to grab that record, you know, of, of, you know, text messages or emails or whatever the case may be, as long as it's not passing through a city server, then we're going to require a court order to get that, okay, because um, that's going to be privately held. Now, I will tell you, if you're familiar with the law in other states, 
There are other states who have found differently on that matter. That has not been decided in the state of Missouri at this point, but at, you know, currently the state of the law is that if you have a private phone and it is not passing through any sort of a public server in any way, then your information is not going to be sunshineable. Uh, I guess we turned that into a verb. Uh, so, uh, but if, if you are using the public server or a publicly uh, utilized phone, then you have to be careful that, you know, you have to understand that that information, you know, could very well, it is, is very likely open. A uh, couple other notes I'd like to throw in here. Number one is any electronic message that is communicated to a quorum of a public governmental body, okay? And so, you know, public governmental body is not just the council. I may, maybe kind of didn't describe that quite right earlier. But if you, you know, you're a board, you're a commission, you're even a quasi-governmental, you, know, uh, you know, group, you know, you've been put together to do something on behalf of the city, you know, and when you've got a quorum, if you're emailing to a quorum of that, you must also email a, a city-owned site, and you must also email, include on that email, the city's custodian of record, which I assume here is going to be your city clerk. That's what it is normally in city. So uh, be very careful. I know sometimes, you know, like maybe like with a parks commission, something like that, you all are just trying to get together to see what time the, the roadside cleanup is, but you, you send it to everybody on the group. At that point, actually what you have done is you've created an electronic meeting. You know, we used to talk a lot about electronic meetings, like kind of this, this, you know, kind of thing that we didn't all understand. Boy, last year changed that, right? Now we know all about electronic meetings with Zoom and, and all the other platforms that are out there. But even sending an email and then, you know, to like the, a, a, you know, the quorum of a body, whether that's the PNZ Commission or the City Council or, or you know, whatever group you can think of, if you send that to a quorum then it's got to also go to the records custodian. And if you reply to all, you have just created an electronic meeting. So when I know when I'm emailing information, and it's easy, I, you know, like you really need to have the ability to send a one-way communication out to everybody so that it's uniform and so everybody gets it. I always put right in the subject matter, all caps, do not reply to all. That way we don't create a, 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 a uh, electronic meeting inadvertently that wasn't, you know, subject, you know, didn't allow the public to review it and didn't have a 24-hour notice like, like is required. Um, and while I said, uh, and the other thing I, I said, you know, before I kind of mentioned kind of offhand is, you know, you can act, I mean, you can, it's illegal to do this, right? But it is possible to have more than one meeting at this time. Like if, if we're sitting in here and we've got probably quorums of a couple of different commissions, right? All at the same time. If y'all are sitting there texting with each other saying, man, this guy is boring as hell, um, you know, you're actually, you know, probably conducting a meeting within this meeting. And there might be five meetings going on, you know, at this point uh, right now. But, so you have to be careful. I'm just saying flat, don't do this. Like, I've actually sat in meetings before where I'm looking and I can tell, you know, my board of aldermen or my council members are literally texting each other. Because they're all hee hee in about, you know, this, that, or the other thing. And I'm like, put it out right now. You know, like, stop, do not text each other while you're on the dais, no matter what it is you're doing. Keep your conversation, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when the teacher used to bust you and it's like, you know, Mr. Smith, do you have something you want to share to the whole class? You know, I feel like doing that sometimes, but you, you know, definitely do not be doing those communications while you're in a meeting because you're actually holding a second meeting, you know, in conjunction with the meeting that everybody can see. Uh, that's a bad deal. Okay. So what, how do we ad, uh, uh, adapt the Sunshine Law to modern policy and what are our best practices? Well, I think, you know, more than anything, when you're in a meeting, go back to the old uh, uh, tin can and string. That's probably the best way to do it. It keeps you out of trouble that way. Um, just kidding. Um, it is important to have policies that regard technology that comply with both the letter and the spirit of the Sunshine Law. Remembering, again, the Sunshine Law should apply very liberally. Uh, best practices are to develop clear and concise policies for using technology to designate a technology an open government official, you know, maybe through your IT department or in conjunction with your city clerk's office. Uh, have a backup plan. Encourage collaboration between anybody who's responsible for Sunshine Law compliance, which might be your city attorney or your city clerk, and the IT department because that's going to be important. And then you always need to keep Sunshine Law in mind when you're negotiating contracts with your communications providers or your IT uh, vendors. Uh, so a couple of things to just keep in mind, you know, when we're dealing with Sunshine Law and technology. 
So uh, Sunshine Law, we, as we uh, continue to go here, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the requirements again. So uh, public meeting procedures, you know, talking about the meetings themselves. Uh, a couple things, you must give a notice of a public meeting and, and the meeting must be held at a reasonable time and place. Okay, you have to keep in time uh, that a time and place may be reasonable and still not really work well. You know, I've always, you know, found it interesting, like if, if you ever pay attention to uh, Kansas City, Missouri City Council, does anybody know what time of the day they meet? 2 p.m., I think, yeah, 2 or 3 p.m. In, in the afternoon, which, you know, like, gosh, if somebody works a regular 9 to 5 job, how the heck are they going to go there? I've always wondered about that, you know, but, hey, they do it, and I guess they get away with it. So most of the cities I work with, you know, they'll meet at 6, 6.30, 7, 7.30 at night, you know, so that people have an opportunity to get home, get the kids off to do whatever, eat some dinner, and then go to the meeting, and everybody has an opportunity to, uh, to go. Uh, reasonable time and place. Uh, one of the things that is important is you always need to have enough room to accommodate. So, you know, I, I work with some very small cities. I mean, shoot, I could probably fit, you know, eight or nine, ten city halls inside this building or in this room alone. Uh, sometimes they're only like one little room, you know, like Uric, Missouri, you know, we have to like, you know, kind of reach past the coffee maker to, you know, make a motion or something like that. Um, but we've had situations before where there's like something that comes up that's a really hairy issue. And so, you know, we'll have to literally go and ask the Lions Club if we can hold our meeting over there so there's enough room for all the pitchforks and torches when folks come in. So, um, so uh, uh, anyway, so keep those things in mind. Uh, you do have to uh, keep minutes of your meetings. That's a requirement. But uh, what I will tell you is, interestingly, the, the legal standard for minutes is actually way less than most people say uh, or most people would think that they are. Like, you don't have to keep a verbatim record of what is said at every meeting. It's enough to say, you know, uh, you know, really who was there, who was not there, you know, if there were votes, who made the motions, and what the outcome of the votes were. You don't have to, you know, uh, make a, a, you know, a completely verbatim, you know, record of, of meetings. But each city is going to have a different policy on that, and there is historical value in keeping a little more robust minutes, you know, just for the ability to go back and check later. Um, you are allowed to have emergency meetings. Um, if you do, it has to be a true emergency. It just can't be because we all couldn't get together on Tuesday because, you know, our favorite television show was on or something like that, right? You have to have a real emergency, and you know, we're talking, and I'm, you know, like talking tornado, uh, earthquake, you know, kind of emergency, you know, not, not you know, like you know, my example of the, the television show. Um, you are allowed to hold electronic meetings. Uh, you know, again, that used to be a shocker sometimes when I would tell this, you know, a year or two ago. Uh, after last year, I think we all kind of have that. I don't know, you know, how many of you actually participated in electronic meetings. I mean, obviously, if you, were ke you kept meeting, like, I, I became the king of Zoom last year for sure. Uh, and, hey, you know, we represent cities as far out as, like, Rich Hill, Missouri, and, you know, Odessa, and, and uh, you know, places like that uh, up um, uh, uh, Weston, Missouri, are, are cities that we represent. It's a lot better to sit at my house and do those from there as opposed to have to actually go out to the meeting. So I, you know, kind of was like when things started opening back up again, I was like, oh, dang, I'm going to have to get back on the road again. So, uh, all right. So public record procedures. Uh, you are required in that little book and in, in section six, or chapter 610, you are required to have a reasonable written policy. Super important. So uh, I kind of made this point earlier, but I want to emphasize it right now is, you know, if you've got a records policy, you, you should have a records policy, you're required to, your records policy should say, uh, with respect to closed records in particular, it needs to say all records that can be closed are closed. And if you have meetings, you know, like meetings that, you know, the, whichever body, if you happen to go into a closed meeting, you actually have the vote right then and there for that meeting. Uh, but without that, you know, uh, arguably your records aren't closed if you don't actually do that. So if a public uh, records request comes in, a couple points about that. Typically, the records custodian is designated at my, usually it's the city clerk, depending on how uh, sophisticated your, your city is. It might extend to a couple other clerks, like maybe in the police department or something like that, where you might have some separation uh, from that standpoint. Um, but when a records request is made, it is, it is, uh, there is three days to respond to the records request, okay? And so the way that gets measured is it's not, you know, from the moment that the person makes the request. So, like, say, you know, like, tonight is Thursday night. 
know, so let's say at 4.45, right before I was ready to walk out the door, I get a notice from uh, my city clerk that at 4.30 this afternoon, she received a records request, okay? You don't actually count the day that the record comes in. You count the day after, that so is the very first day. And then you only count days where City Hall is open. So if we received a records request at 4.30 on Thursday, we would count Friday, Monday, Tuesday is when the response is due, okay? And the response is not that you have to actually produce the record per se, but it's just to say, hey, we got your request, we're working on it. Because sometimes the answer is, holy smokes, you just asked for 8 million emails. Are you kidding me? That's going to take us two years for us to get that pulled together. Uh, and the other thing I will tell you is when you have a records request, uh, you are allowed to charge folks uh, for gathering the records before you actually uh, gather the records. And they, they, they would need to pay. Uh, a lot of times, you know, people would go through the process of spending hours upon hours of gathering all the requests and then you know they would come back and say you know we're allowed to charge 10 cents per page and you know so many dollars per hour for the people that were looking into it so your bill is now five hundred dollars and like Bloop, no thanks it's like well too late you've already expended your city resources at that point so you're allowed to tell them you know we estimate it's going to take x amount of time we need you to pay this amount if it actually takes us less we'll refund you if it, it takes you more you'll have to pay us more before we uh, turn those over and you can have a reasonable time to, to turn that over, but you need to provide the information and the justification why uh, when you do that. It is okay to waive fees. We don't recommend it because then you start to get into this whole, you know, discretion thing and, you know, are you discriminating against one person or another? Or, you know, like what's your purpose for saying this one's waived and that one's not? It's just better to say we don't waive them. Here's the charges. It costs the city money. Why should the city's citizens pay for all of this, you know, through taxpayer dollars? So. Voting procedures, uh, you always have to record your regular votes, you always have to record uh, your, your roll call votes, and you always have to record your emergency votes. Hey, there's a theme here, record all your votes. Um, we record them by putting them in the minutes for the most part uh, uh, there, and in certain votes, you know, do have to be recorded the eyes and nays. Uh, close, closed session, for example, is, is definitely required. Uh, so what are reasons that we can close meetings, records, and votes? There's actually a list of like 20, what is it, three or something like that. You guys have the book. Um, uh, different exceptions uh, that, that are out there. And they're, kind of, they're all kind of uh, summarized right here on this page. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. The, the first three exceptions tend to be the most common, uh, which are for legal advice. So you know, when you, uh, as, a, as a city body, you are entitled to uh, attorney-client uh, privilege communication. Okay, so you can go in and confer with your attorney so that your attorney can tell you, you know, hey, you know, wow, you guys screwed up. You're going to have a huge amount of liability, you know, and we don't want to actually say that in the public, right? So that, you know, somebody says, geez, we're going to get hit with a million dollars here. Um, but also to say, you know, hey, if we did this, you know, what are our options? And so, you know, the lawyer can kind of come in and say, okay, well, you know, if you want to be super conservative about it, you know, you could go this route. You're going to have, you know, not too much liability, but, you know, the outcome on that might really be terrible or you don't like it, you know, or you could be super, you know, kind of risky if you want and, you know, really push the envelope. But if you do that, you know, the likelihood of you getting sued is going to go up and then you got to defend a lawsuit and you might lose and, blah, you know, and so we talk about those things and then, you know, and then, you know, everybody always looks at the lawyer and says, well, what should we do? I don't know, that's why you got elected. You do it. <laughs> So, but, you know, in the end, that's a policy decision, you know, for policy makers. And so, uh, but we can provide that. So legal actions, real estate transactions, and personnel and employment matters are, are you know, kind of the top three. And really, it's one in three. The, real, the legal and the personnel are the things that, you know, kind of can pop up on us very unexpectedly. And so I always recommend to my clients, you know, at least notice up every meeting for legal and personnel. Because, you know, if you have to post your notice on a Friday night because you have a Monday meeting, you know, what happens if, you know, the, the, you know, chief of police, you know, gets drunk and wrecks his car around a, a tree or something. Sorry, I hope the chief's not in here. But, um, but you know, it happened in one community in this area uh, you know, about a dozen years ago. So um, you got to deal with that that night. And it's better to have that stuff, you know, actually on the agenda. So, um, these are just more of the examples. And actually, that book does a really fantastic job of going through all of the, uh, the uh, uh, reasons that you can close. And so you know, now we're on our third slide there. So, um, so let's uh, move past the, the, uh, the ability to close records. And let's talk about closed meetings and, and voting procedures. So 
if you're going to have a closed meeting, you do need to list that on your agenda. You gotta let the public know that you're doing a closed meeting. Um, so uh, uh, you have to make a motion to go into closed session. So this is kind of important, you know, for those of you that, you know, maybe you're in a, a board that doesn't really go to closed sessions very often, but I always kind of put it this way. A closed section, you know, a closed session of your meeting, and I'm thinking of parentheticals here when I'm doing this, right, is so you've got the open meeting, right? The closed meeting is inside that. That's like the little parentheticals inside of the sentence here. Okay, so you, you're in an open meeting, you go into a closed meeting, you come out of the closed meeting before you end the open meeting. Okay, they're all closed meetings are always entirely enclosed within an open meeting. Sometimes my clients will have a special closed meeting. Okay, and that's fine. You can do that, but. You still have to have an open meeting. You open the meeting, vote to go into closed session, do your closed session stuff, vote to go out of closed session, and then adjourn your regular meeting. Okay, so always completely in, enclosed within an open meeting. You gotta stay on topic, okay? We went through kind of quickly, but we went through all of the exceptions as to why you can be in there. So if you're in there to talk legal, and then all of a sudden you say, and oh, by the way, I'm really ticked off about where that stop sign got put on Main Street or whatever. Like, whoop, whoop, stop. You can't talk about stuff that was not noticed up from a closed meeting. Okay? You gotta stay on the topic, okay? Now, that's not to say you don't have three different topics of legal that you need to go through, but you gotta be very careful to keep the meeting topics and, and the discussion limited to what you're in there for, okay? Uh, you know, don't, don't jump around. And if you're not noticed up for real estate and something came up, talk about it. You're going to have to have a, another meeting, maybe a special closed session to talk about that, or just wait until next time when you get it noticed up properly. Okay. Um, when you are in closed session, you can only vote by roll call. Okay. Every vote has to be by roll call. So even the motion to go out of closed session has to be done by roll call. Um, keep basic minutes. You know, as a lawyer, you know, if you've got closed session stuff to talk about, there's a reason that it, you know, it's in closed session. I don't like to have a lot of records floating around out there. You know, again, what the law requires is, you know, date, time, place of meeting, who was present, who was absent, and whether there were any votes. Boop, that's the end of it. We discussed a matter of person, we discussed a personnel matter, period, done. So, um, you know, again, some cities treat that a little bit differently just for the historical value of it, but, you know, I'm, you know, I'm always concerned about having a record that lives long beyond the closed meeting. Um, you, you know, you have to have a motion to go out of close. As I said before, you got to do roll call votes on that. And you should put all your reportable actions on the record, you know, essentially, you know, again, talking really about motions and votes uh, and so forth. Closed records procedures. You are required by the Sunshine Law to separate your open and your closed records. Sometimes you have a record that is both open and closed, you know, and that talks about redaction. Redaction is a lot. You know, redaction is when you see the, the giant, you know, marker that, that crossed everything out or whatever. If you're redacting, be super careful because sometimes you can still read the print through those markers depending on that. So like I always kind of like do it, mark it out and then make a copy of it because it usually takes out you know, that. So you know, just be super careful that people can't still read it because there's nothing worse than redacting and then you can see everything that's in it. So, um, uh, denying requests, you are allowed to deny a request uh, if the record is not open, but you do have to do uh, that in writing and give the justifications for if there are complaints about the Sunshine Law, you can, those are processed by the AG's department, uh, department, the Attorney General, so that's Eric Schmidt there at the bottom, the guy that's you know, gracing the front of your little books there. Um, the, the, if you have had a complaint filed against you, the AG's office will typically send a, uh, uh, a letter of notification to the city along with a written response, and, and so the city can respond to that. Uh, what I always say is be extremely compliant uh, and cooperative when you're dealing with the uh, Attorney General's office with respect to these uh, complaints. Um, the lawyers at the Attorney General's office get these all the time. They kind of know that a lot of times people have an ax to grind of some sort or, you know, they're just angry, you know, about one thing or another and, you know, that, that's the, the knee-jerk reaction. You know, and again, not to, you know, not to dismiss, you know, that people would have a complaint. You know, and sometimes the city is the one who has a complaint about something. You know, I have a client right now who, in dealing with CARES Act money uh, last year and how that was being distributed, they went to their county 
and actually the county was, you know, the offices were closed and they wouldn't let the city administrator in. And when he finally got in, they disagreed, you know, on a matter and they kicked him out. And he asked us to file a, a complaint with the attorney general's office. And that county just got sued uh, last month uh, for serious Sunshine Law complaints. So it'll be interesting to see how that all uh, changes out. So with that, I am wrapping up the Sunshine Law stuff. We're going to go to ethics and conflicts of interest. But before I do, Let's take another opportunity to uh, see if I can answer any questions about Sunshine Law. No pushing, no shoving. All right, thank you. All right, right, you guys got to catch up over here. They got two. I have two questions, actually. The first one is about the uh, email yes. that you were talking about. If I understand that correctly, what you said is if I sent out an email to everyone on our commission and we started a back and forth conversation, that would be a public meeting. Yeah, so, yeah, so two, two parts to that. Okay, number one is if you send that email to a quorum of your board, okay, so you've got seven people on your parks commission for example you send it to at least five people then you also have to to copy that to an official city website including the city clerk or if assuming that that's your custodian of records okay so that's number one and number two is if you send it out one way not a meeting if some if the reply to all is a meeting so if you send out the so yeah so this gets really intricate and kind of tricky okay and actually uh, Jackie and I talked about this last fall you know on an issue okay so the the way the sunshine law works is you you can send out a one-way communication to the entire group so that everybody gets consistent information okay the individual group members can contact just the sender you know like you say you know the meeting is at 8 30 on tuesday and you know you know uh council member jones you know sends back a message to say well i thought it was at eight are you sure it's at 8 30. that conversation can occur why why can that occur it's not a quorum right let's see if we're pretending that you have a seven member board as long as you're not involving five people then you haven't created a quorum okay so let's take it to a different situation. Let's say you're the chairperson. I have no idea. But let's say you're the chairperson, and you really want to know how your other members feel about a particular issue on a, a vote, for example. OK? You can legally, and, and I'll say, you know, I, I hope I'm not, like Jackie's going to throw a flag here in a second or something like that. But um, you, in my personal opinion, so we'll say you know, my opinion is legally that you can have a conversation as the chairperson with each individual person on your commission to see how they feel about things, okay? Here's what you cannot do. You cannot go to Commissioner A and talk and then go to Commissioner B and say, hey, I just talked to Commissioner A and here's what they think. What do you think, okay? And the way I describe this is you cannot be the bee that pollinates the flowers, okay? So if through your conversation you end up creating a quorum because you've shared what a quorum of people will do, you've now created a meeting that wasn't noticed up, okay? And so the simple way to think of it is the reply to all because that happens instantaneously enough. There is a more complicated way, which is what I just described to you, is you know, if you over time go and say, I've talked to these three and this is what they said and now you've created a quorum, now you've violated the Sunshine Law because you have, and there's actually a case on this that involved the Kansas City, Missouri School Board, uh, and you know they, they really dissected you know the you know what happens and, and at what point do you stop having you know just a discussion and you've turned it into a meeting and it's when you you tip over and you've included a quorum in the decision making and you didn't include the public notice it provide an agenda those types of things. But you can still send out an email to everyone as long as you say you're not replying to all. As a well, I mean, saying reply to all is one thing. I send that email all the time, and constantly I just want to go throat punch somebody because they respond to all saying, well, I'll be there, or whatever, you know, and it's like, I just said right there, no, you know, don't reply to all. So just putting don't reply to all is not enough. 
It's the fact that people don't reply to all. That's the big, that's the, 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 the critical part. And then my second question was about uh, the uh, the minutes and what is required in minutes and what is public record. That what about the person's individual notes that you take in a meeting? Using your example of a closed meeting on a controversial topic, maybe the minutes just report what you said, but I've got four pages of notes. Right. Thank you. That's a tough question. I'm so sorry. That's probably one I would actually have to look up. Um, but let me let me wing it here. I believe, oof, I don't want to tell you something wrong. I believe that your individual notes are private, provided that you haven't shared them with the body itself. So it's kind of what action that you would have taken to make it more public. So if it's your notes and what you're doing, I think your thoughts that were kept to yourself are going to be not subject to the Sunshine Law. But if you end up you know, saying, here's my notes on everything and send it out to everybody, then you've taken something that would have otherwise not been subject to Sunshine Law and then make it Sunshine Law. Jackie's going to throw a flag. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so hopefully I answered that right. I'll be honest with you. I mean, that, that's one I'd have to look up. Oh, she is. <laughs> here it comes. This is deserved. I, I was winging it. I just wanted to say that uh, our city clerk has a, an email account. Okay. Our city clerk has an email account at cityclerk at newspringsgov.com. So if you have a question about sending an email out, you're sending it to more than one member of your, your public body, really copy her. It's just, it just holds those emails. No one's monitoring it, but it does create a record that we can use in such a law of meetings, it's probably not a sunshine law document, but if there's a lawsuit and you have records that you have, it's possible that they can be um, discovered through uh, court action. That line. Yeah, great point. So if you didn't hear, hear what, what Jackie just said, is while, it, while you have an item that might not be subject to the sunshine law, it doesn't mean that it's not discoverable in a lawsuit. Okay, there is a distinction, there's a difference there. So, um, so I, I think you kind of, you, you did just back me up, so thanks. Uh, I think I, I did get that right. And that's a great point that you made though, is you know, even though something might not be subject to an open records request, it might still be open to uh, some sort of a, uh, uh, a discovery request in, in a lawsuit. I thought I could maybe look it up real quick, but I, I, I think that helps me remember the answer. So. Other questions? Aw, oh, dang. Come on, make me earn my money tonight. Okay. All right. I think, uh, I think we're going to move on. So do you want to go ahead and move to the next, next subject then? Okay. All right. So we're going to go into uh, ethics and conflicts of interest. Um, so... Uh, Whenever we're looking at issues that, that deal with city's authority, uh, we always have to kind of look at what are the sources of authority. So um, here, when we talk about where do the rules for ethics and conflict of interest, where do they come from? They come from several different layers of governmental uh, regulations, if you will. So we really start with the Missouri Constitution. That's where the, the people put their power into the, uh, the government uh, uh, for uh, Missouri. And then they have delegated some of that authority to the legislature, the, the Missouri General Assembly. And the Missouri General Assembly, General Assembly uh, then sets their regulations, which we talked about earlier tonight, are the statutes, or the Missouri Revised Statutes, RISMO for short sometimes. And then the legislature then further delegates authority down to the local government level uh, to be applied at that level. And that's where we find our rules in our city charter, Blue Springs is a charter city, so you guys actually draw your authority straight from the Missouri Constitution. Uh, home rule charter cities like Blue Springs, uh, they have all of the power that the General Assembly could have assigned to them, uh, or that, that, ha that the, I'm sorry, I said it backwards, told the punchline. They have all of the powers that the General Assembly have given to 
home rule charter cities. So there are actually, there's a chapter in the Missouri statute that govern, that, that lay out powers for home rule cities. And they have all of the powers that the General Assembly could have given them. So home rule charter is, is it's, a, it's a pretty cool, broad uh, opportunity. You know, there aren't that many charter cities. I mean, there, there's seven, I mean, quite a few, but when you look at, you know, the, like six or 700 plus cities in Missouri, um, you know, the, the charter cities really just aren't that many. And you have to be at a population of, uh, oh shoot, I should know that number off the top of my head and I don't. It's, uh, it's several thousand. So, you know, some of the smaller cities you're going to find are going to be fourth class or third class cities. And fourth class cities, they all have to derive their power from statutes. So, you know, if you look to, you know, your neighbor, you know, to the, uh, to the uh, um, east Grain Valley, they're a fourth class city. They have to find all of their powers from statutes. Blue Springs, your powers come from your charter, which springs straight from the, the Constitution. So, uh, so you have your charter, your local ordinances, your policies and procedures that you've adopted are places that you would find where your rules for uh, uh, conflicts of interest and ethics come from. Okay, so we're going to cover some of the statutory provisions just so you're aware that these exist. Um, so, um, and I could, you know, almost do like a, a, like a half day seminar on all of this stuff. We're going to go through it here pretty quickly. So, um, what you're going to, so some of the, the topics that we're going to cover here tonight are the, uh, the prohibited acts that are in the statute. We're going to talk about nepotism and what that means, because some people kind of use that too broadly. Uh, we're going to talk about incompatible offices, quasi-judicial decisions, personal financial disclosures, and, and just the appearance of impropriety uh, uh, you know, as we go through. So uh, first thing we're going to talk about is prohibited act. So again, you see that 105.452 RISMO at the top. This is a statutory requirement. And you also see that 105.452 applies to elected or appointed officials. Okay, So if you are appointed by the mayor, approval of the council, or if you are actually elected to your provision, to your position, this, these are things that you cannot do, okay? So you cannot act or refrain from acting because of an offer to pay. You know, someone can't say, you know, hey, don't vote on this item and I'll give you uh, 5,000 bucks. You know, that's, can't do that, right? That's a bribe. Um, you cannot use or disclose confidential information obtained in your office for employment uh, or employment for financial gain, okay? So if you're on the planning commission, you hear about this hot, you know, new project that might be coming in, but they need to buy the, the land first, you can't go out and scoop up that land and, and profit off of that, okay? If you learn that information through your role, you know, you, you got to stay away from that transaction, okay? You cannot favorably act on a matter specifically designed to provide yourself a special monetary benefit. So if you're, you know, city council member and, and you're, you know, setting some rules that, um, that you know, you... Uh, you know, that you would ultimately get, you know, you know, money or, you know, some sort of services from, you have to be careful. So a lot of times, maybe in my smaller communities, you know, the, the question comes up on this one is kind of like, well, I just voted to pave the street in front of my house, you know. Well, if, if you voted to pave, you know, just the patch in front of your own house, then yeah, that probably was a conflict of interest. But if you voted to, you know, pave Main Street from 3rd Street to, to 6th Street, you know, all of the other people that live on those houses, on, on, on those, that street also benefited. So you didn't get a special monetary benefit in that circumstance. So you kind of see the distinction there. Um, you cannot use decision-making authority for your own financial gain. And you cannot advocate for an appointment in exchange for value. Okay? So you, you know, basically what I'm saying is, is if you're, you know, before you get appointed to your position, you can't say, hey, mayor, you know, help me out here. You know, get me appointed to the planning commission and I'll give you, you know, 5,000 bucks or I'll mow your lawn for free for the next year or something like that, okay? So you have to be careful you know, about those things. Those are all, uh, would be statutory violations uh, and would be subject to criminal penalties uh, if, if you are convicted of those. 105.454, you just turn the page in the Missouri Revised Statutes and what you have here is prohibited acts that deal with elected or appointed officials serving in an executive or administrative capacity, okay? So, um, we're going to have a slide, you know, kind of at the end tonight that we're going to talk about this, but maybe I'll just go ahead and cover it now just as easily, is even at local government level, even though we don't have partisan politics at the local government level, we still do have separation of powers, just like we do. So, you know, at the federal level, 
we have the President of the United States, we have the Congress, and we have the United, the United States Supreme Court, the U.S. court system, okay? That is your executive or administrative branch, your legislative branch, and your judicial branch, as I just described, those, okay? State level, just the same. We have our governor. We have our, you know, executive or administrative branch. You know, and then, you know, you've got Department of Natural Resources. You've got Department of Revenue. Those are all, you know, like, you know akin to the EPA or, um, you know, think of any other, uh, you know, Homeland Security or any of those administrative branches of federal government. We have that at the state government level as well. And, of course, we have our Missouri Supreme Court and our district court system as our judiciary, okay? The difference is there being... The, uh, the legislature passes the rules. They pass the laws that apply to everybody, okay? The administrative branch has the responsibility of enforcing those laws, okay? So they then take fact situations that people find themselves in, and they say, you know, is this a violation of that law or not? You know, and, and they, they will actually, you know, write a citation if there's a violation, okay? And then, of course, our judiciary system is designed to interpret the law, to say, hey, yeah, you wrote that citation, but you were completely wrong in that. We're going to find that we're going to overturn your decision and say that this person, you know, did act fine, okay? Um, so when we have that. So here we're talking about elected or appointed officials who serve in an executive or administrative capacity. So, you know, the first place I'm going to tell you to look is, you know, your administrative, uh, usually the head of your administration for cities is going to be your mayor from an elected standpoint. Uh, or you're, in your case, you have a city administrator. That's your head executive um, from the appointed side. Now, you know, because of your charter, your mayor actually kind of you know, sits in both worlds uh, because your mayor actually votes uh, on matters as well as uh, uh, it helps to administer the law. So your mayor actually is both legislative and administrative. Um, that's you know, a little bit more rare uh, that we find that in cities. You know, if you were at a statutory city, you know, like, you know, Grain Valley or Oak Grove, which are fourth class cities, their mayors actually cannot vote uh, unless there is a tie. And so they're not usually, they're more involved in the administration or the enforcement of laws as opposed to the actual making of the laws other than that tie vote situation. So if you're an executive uh, uh, official, there's this whole long list of things that you can't do. You know, basically what I'll say is, um, you know, for the most part, if you do anything for money in your role as a city, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> Don't do that. There are some exceptions to the prohibited acts. As long as your transactions are, are de minimis or they're you know uh, kind of neg neg negligible, you know if they're if they're under 500 bucks uh, per transaction or under 5,000 dollars per year, you know you don't have to worry about you know the additional uh, you don't have to worry about these prohibited acts. Um, or if you're in a situation where you uh, competitively bid and you were absolutely the lowest price. Uh, bitter on something where you're selling your services or a good or something like that, then that's something that, that you will be able to do provided that you went through those. Okay. Prohibited acts, uh, members of governing bodies, uh, very similar to what I just described, so I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on these, but again, if you're doing something for money, you know, that involves the city, you're going to have to be super careful, uh, and then, you know, there's that de minimis exception that kind of applies to uh, members of governing bodies as well, so we're talking about in this circumstance specifically to the city council. Um, prohibited acts. If you have an interest in a proposed ordinance as, uh, as a member of the governing body, you do have to uh, uh, make a uh, written report of that interest with the city clerk. And you have to do that before the ordinance is passed upon. Um, now, if you have personal financial disclosures, which we'll talk about in a different slide here, on file, that will actually address the issue. But if you don't have personal financial disclosures on something, and you're making a decision about something you're actually, like you're making a decision in your official role for the city on something that you have an interest in, then uh, you're, you're going to be uh, uh, violating uh, the ethics uh, statutes. And we'll get to that in just a minute uh, on the uh, personal financial disclosures. Okay, so if you have rulemaking authority, so what's rulemaking authority? Like one place that rulemaking authority applies at the city level would be potentially uh, planning and zoning commission when you're doing like comprehensive plan and things like that. You have to be careful. So uh, you know, again, understand that you know there are going to be some prohibited uh, acts there um, uh, uh, with respect to uh, uh, your interests. So um, a, 
uh, and I'm, I'll cover uh, what, what a substantial interest is in, in just a moment when we cover the city provisions. But, you know, again, these have these de minimis, you know, uh, 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 exceptions that apply. And, you know, for the most part, it, you know, it's what you'd think if you're going to make money off of something that you're doing. Uh, so we'll, uh, you'll have to uh, um, um, not participate in, in that act. All right. Uh, if you are in a judicial or quasi-judicial position, uh, you have to be careful. So what is a quasi-judicial quasi uh, position? Um, judicial is pretty easy. You know, if you're part of, if you're the judge in the municipal court, you're in a judicial position for the city, okay? Now, if you are on the board of zoning adjustment, you are in a quasi-judicial position. So what you are doing as a board of zoning adjustment member is you are interpreting the law as it was applied to a certain situation. So whether it's, you know, does a, you know, can a variance apply from the zoning application? You're looking at the fact situation of, uh, of, of the application coming to you and you're making a decision about the law whether you're going to bend the law or not. And sometimes the BZA will take a look at, you know, decisions that code officials made. If you are in a situation where you are, you know, especially like BZA perk up right here, you cannot participate in any proceeding where you know that the party uh, coming to you is either a great-grandparent or a grandparent, a parent, step-parent, guardian, or foster parent, a spouse or a former spouse, a uh, child, stepchild, foster child, or ward, brother, sister, niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, or cousin. That's a very specific list that was taken directly from the uh, statutes, and so be very careful, if, especially your BZA, quasi-judicial is you, so watch out for that. Um, your city charter does have prohibited activities in it. It's at section 12.3 of the uh, city charter. Uh, there are provisions in there that deal with non-discrimination, so you cannot make decisions uh, or uh, take actions against people that would be based on race, sex, age, disability, uh, national origin, or political or religious opinions or affiliation, so be very careful about that. You cannot make false or fraudulent statements. Um, that deal with someone's employment with the city and uh, no, uh, no quid pro quo. So, you, you know, no something for something, uh, you know, with respect to uh, seeking, you know, various uh, uh, appointments or things like that. We kind of talked about that with the state stuff. Nepotism, let's talk about that very quickly. These requirements come from the Missouri Constitution. It's Article 7, Section 6. So Missouri Constitution trumps all uh, with respect to whether you have a city charter or whatever. You know, you're going to have to comply with this. This applies to public officers and public employees. You cannot name or appoint relatives within the fourth degree of consanguinity or affinity on that. So what the heck did I just say? Consanguinity is a blood relative, okay? Uh, affinity is a marriage relative, okay? So if you are related to someone within those four degrees, do not be involved in their hiring, uh, in, in other decisions about retention, things like that. Uh, and that group, you know, the rings that you see there on that kind of the target, you are the dot in the middle. Oh, and your spouse is the dot in the middle. Consanguinity is you, affinity is, is your spouse. Two is brothers, sisters, grandparents, and grandchildren. Three is aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, great-grandparents, and great-grandchildren. Four gets out to great-niece, great-nephews, First cousins, great aunts. I represent some cities that that would be the whole dang town <laughs> in that fourth ring. So you have to be super careful. Thankfully, you got more you know resources available to you from a people standpoint in Blue Springs. So um, you just have to be careful from that standpoint that you are not putting some because the nepotism provision in in the uh, uh, in the uh, Missouri Constitution is what they call self-enforcing. Okay. So if you have appointed somebody who falls in that ring, you have vacated your office. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Okay? Uh, there's a situation where the city of Holden several years ago, the guy who ran for mayor had been their, police, uh, their fire chief. He got mayor. He decided to put his, his brother-in-law in as the fire chief, you know, and he, who served with him on the fire department. And in doing that, he immediately vacated his office, literally two days into office. And... Uh, the attorney general came in and said, nope, self-executing, you're out. So he was out, and everybody said, oh, we love this mayor. So they reappointed him to fill his own vacancy, and the attorney general swooped back in and said, nope, you don't get it, he's out. 
He had to sit out until the next election, two years later, before he could actually, you know, win again and not appoint his brother-in-law this time. So brother-in-law tried to quit. I mean, they tried everything to fix it. Attorney General said, no, nope, not happening. So incompatible offices. Uh, people can hold two offices at the same time. And the, the question is, is, are there supervisory roles? Is there financial oversight? Things like that. If you have supervisory financial oversight, then you can't serve in, in both offices at the same time. Um, but if, as long as you don't have those things, you actually can. So uh, the pictures there are uh, Dan Tarwater, our Jackson County uh, chairman, uh, cannot serve as mayor. Uh, you know, we have uh, Quentin Lucas there, but um, uh, because there's too much interchange between the county and the city. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, but you know, you can serve on the school board and the city council because in Missouri we don't have the, uh, the interplay between those two as much as like other states. Like where I grew up in Ohio, schools are actually run by the city. Interesting. So, uh, decision making that's out there, we have legislative and quasi-judicial. Remember, legislative is when we're making the rules to apply to all. Judicial is when we're interpreting, uh, so we'll cover that. Uh, you know, when you're doing quasi-judicial decisions, again, kind of BZA is there. You know, don't have ex parte communication. Don't be talking to applicants outside the hearing. Talk only during the hearing. Uh, and prejudgment bias, don't be out there saying, I'm not going to listen. You know, I I've already made up my mind before you've heard the case. We'll cover, you know, some of this for those of you who are in those situations more at the next one. Um, uh, personal financial disclosures. Uh, there are certain requirements for certain officials to file personal financial disclosures. My understanding is that, uh, um, that uh, with the city, the city actually, uh, uh, on who is required to file, you actually uh, repealed your ordinance. Uh, so now you follow the state statute, uh, which says elected officials, candidates for office, chief administrative officer, chief purchasing officer, general counsel if employed full time, and persons uh, authorized by the governing body to create or vote on regulations uh, with the force of law. Um, so that's the city charter provisions there. Uh, very quickly, appearance of impropriety. I oftentimes tell people that when it comes to uh, conflict of interest, many times uh, you will fail in the court of public perception a long time before you will fail in the court of law. You saw a lot of very specific provisions this evening and as long as you weren't violating those, you're not in conflict of interest, but you're going to get slaughtered on that social media that we talked about before, you know, if you're out doing stuff that just smells bad. So just be careful, you know, with respect to that. Um, it's not usually going to be a legal conflict of interest, but, you know, it's, it is stuff um, that you need to be aware of because it can hurt you politically. Um, so last couple of closing thoughts. I'm not going to cover administrative versus legislative because we just did that a few minutes ago, but that applies at the local level. And let me just talk for just a moment about practical advice, okay? A couple things that I think, you know, I just think that are important for the good governance and good running of a city is uh, these items. Number one, trust city staff. If you're an elected official, if you're an appointed official, um, understand, you know, all due respect, but you're an amateur. <laughs> you've been elected, you've been, you know, you volunteer, you know, like this is something that you do because you actually make a living doing something else. City staff, this is what their vocation is. This is how they put food on their table. This is how they provide for their families. This is what they have chosen to do in their life, okay? This, this is real to them and they are professionals in this and their job is to provide all of the elected and appointed officials who have decisions to make, but the information necessary to do that. Utilize these folks, respect you know, what it is that they do for you, and, and, and challenge them to get you the information you need to make the best decisions you possibly can. And they will challenge themselves to do that. Again, this is what they've chosen to do for their career. Uh, give fair warning. Don't roll into a meeting with knowing full well that you've got some gotcha moment and, and you're going to you know, dump something on staff. If you know of an issue, get it to staff as soon as possible. Because when you roll into a meeting and you're playing gotcha, you know, you're going to look to the constituents, the people that are watching on TV and the people who, you know, maybe check it out on YouTube later. You're going to look like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. When you had just come in and talked to staff and said, hey, I've got a problem. This constituent called me and they've got a real issue. That staff member can go look into the issue or maybe they know about the issue already and they say, you know, I appreciate that, you know, council member so-and-so or chairman so-and-so, you know, but 
here's the backstory of that. So that you hear both sides of the story or you give the staff the ability to go either try to work it out with the citizen and not let something fester, but, uh, but you go ahead and, and you can get results at your meeting and you look like you're working so well together and you're running a great city. Uh, so do that. Involve your city attorney before you make legal decisions. The worst thing you can do is go out and make a decision that essentially you know, is gonna create legal liability for you and then after the fact, come in and ask Jackie, could I do that? No, but if you'd asked me before, I would have stopped you from doing it. Now we're defending a $50,000 lawsuit. Thanks, you know, and your citizens, you know, say the same thing uh, with respect to that. Um, understand that you can call a timeout. If you're in a meeting where things get heated uh, and you've got you either citizens that are, you know, just like breathing fire and, and, you know, coming down your, you know, your throat about something and they've been preparing all day and you're just catching it at the meeting, you know, it's okay to call a recess to allow cooler heads to prevail and to not, you know, the more we do business when things are extremely agitated, the, the worse decisions we're going to make. So it's okay to do that. And don't get into an arguing match. A lot of times, again, people will come in and citizens will try to, you know, catch you in something and they'll have that gotcha moment. That doesn't feel good. And so it's okay to, to listen to what someone has to say and say, hey, we appreciate you bringing that to us. That's obviously an important issue. Let us look into this issue. I'm going to have you know, you know, the department head or the city administrator, whomever is the responsible party, to call you back uh, tomorrow, and let's work to a resolution on that and, and do it in a way that you know, cooler heads can prevail and we don't end up saying something that we regret. Okay. All right. So I kept you over, uh, but I do appreciate uh, your time this evening. I'll make sure I yeah, got to all of it. Uh, so... Um, Again, I'll take any questions that you have at this point, or if, if you guys, you know, uh, assume if you, I don't know if Jackie has anything you want to say, but if you want to head out, if you don't have questions, fine. And I'm, I'm happy to stay after a little bit uh, to answer questions uh, from that standpoint. But um, I just wanted to let everyone know that if you've ever got a question, a legal question, that's what I'm here for. So give me a call or send me an email. Anytime. Yeah, absolutely. Love to do it. Thank you, yeah. Again, thank you.